one of the fears I think that many of the so-called critics of deconstruction have had has been that it in some way undermines the rationality of the subject or the thought that the subject could commit it himself or herself with clear conscious intent to some rationally undertaken project. And I wonder if in this context, and before we go on to the next topic we wanted to talk, talk about, you might have a word of explanation or reassurance mm -hmm. or perhaps non-reassurance. I'm not here to, uh, <coughs> to reassure uh, any, anyone. <laughs> I'm not, I, I didn't travel to reassure anyone. Uh, uh, things first, first, in order to, 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 to think or to, to do something political, you don't have to be reassured don't have to be reassured. Uh, on the contrary, you have to be anxious and, and sometimes scared by, by, uh, by the task which is in, in, in front of you. Now, on the problem of, of rationality, I would, I would reply almost the same thing, I mean formally the same thing. Uh, the people who say that, that deconstruction is, is, is uh, undermining rationality, first, they don't read. And second, second, they refer to a certain state, a certain set of norms they call reason, rationality. And in the same way that the subject has a history, reason has a history. Uh, the, the, our um, rationalism today cannot be the same as uh, rationalism, let's say, for instance, in the 18th century when <coughs> The, the concept of the right of man, the revolution, and, and the declaration of uh, universal rights uh, has been, uh, for the first time, uh, is established. Uh, that's why I uh, uh, would describe deconstruction as a, rational, as a uh, modern rationalism, which tries to incorporate uh, new disciplines, new forms of rationality. When you take, for instance, into account, let's, let's take this, Massive example, uh, psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, which, uh, whatever you think about the complexity of uh, uh, psychoanalysis, which teaches us that uh, a, what we call a subject is not simply consciousness, is not simply the ego. Uh, uh, there is repression. There is there are uh, 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 sometimes a split subject, uh, a multiplicity within the individual, and so on and so forth. Uh, when you take this into account, and to uh, integrate, to incorporate the reference to psychoanalysis in uh, not only the theory, but the practice of law, for instance, of human rights, uh, who is responsible for, for murder, for instance, who is responsible for, uh, for a strike, who is responsible for uh, uh, a political uh, gesture. Uh, the question of this responsibility uh, once you uh, uh, pay attention to the fact that a subject is not simply any, a, a, a transparent ego, uh, uh, refle a reflexive ego, totally present to itself, then you have to transform uh, uh, your approach. You have to transform the, the very concept of reason. <coughs> and uh, to me, psychoanalysis is not I I I irrational. It's a new component of uh, modern rationality. The same with physics, the same with, with uh, biogenetics, uh, all those uh, current problems, the problem of bioethics, problem of, of graftings, the problem of birth uh, control, the problems of, of uh, the uh, excess, the excess of uh, um, people who until now had no access to human rights, uh, uh, children, uh, women, and so on and so forth imply that you re rebuild, if you want, the, the, the concept of reason. So, uh, of course, when you say, well, reason is not simply what you thought it was, then people stand up and say, well, you, you are an irrationalist. You are simply threatening reason. No, uh, on the contrary, I think that it's, it's in, the name, in the name of uh, a new rationalism that deconstruction is necessary. So I, I don't accept, of course the charge of uh, uh, irrationalism on, on, the contrary, on the contrary. Well, I must say I quite like the idea of rebuilding reason because 
Uh, it wanting... rebuilds itself constantly. Yeah. It's, well, it's, with, uh, without wanting to tease you too much about it, rebuilding, I like it because it's rather close to the notion of reconstructing. Keep it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'm rushing you from one enormous topic to another, but it would be a shame not to ask you to say something about your work on this other big topic of national nationalism. Uh, obviously, uh, the relationship between an individual and his nationality or his or her nationality or culture enters into part of the general problem or problematic of how one thinks of the human subject. But you see, you see uh, dealing in, 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 in uh, 60 minutes with deconstruction of the subject, presence, the friendship, and nationality is simply not human. It's a good <laughs> uh, 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 It was in 80... Uh, two or three that we started uh, seminars on nationality and at the time of course the problem of nationality is, is a, an old problem but at the time it didn't have the uh, what's it, the burning the burning uh, uh, presence it has now uh, and we f what we did first uh, was uh, to analyze the reason why philosophy as such, contrary to what we usually think, philosophy is always nationally determined. Usually we think philosophy is a universal discourse and it, it crosses the borders of uh, languages, nations, uh, determined groups, and it, uh, it claims to address the, the, the universal problems. But in fact, not only do we know that philosophy as such, philosophy in the strict sense, was from the beginning uh, linked to uh, determine cities, languages, Greek for instance, and that a philosophical, a philosophical concept is not simply uh, uh, conventionally associated with the Greek word. When I say uh, uh, usia or on for, for being, it not, it's not simply a conventional sign associated with a, a concept. You cannot dissociate a concept from a language, from a, what we call a natural language. Uh, so from the very beginning, philosophy was uh, determined by a cultural, historical, and some uh, put this in, to take in quotation marks, national or ethnical uh, uh, context. Then, uh, when the modern forms of nationalisms appeared in Europe in the 19th century, I would say, uh, it was not in a, in a non-philosophical form. Every nationalism, every national affirmation takes the form of a philosophy. When a nation says, uh, uh, we are Germans, for instance, let's say Fichte's discourse, we are Germans, but this doesn't mean that we are simply a uh, particular people among others. We are, being German means being responsible for humanity, being the best philosophers, being uh, having on us the burden of being responsible for, being witnesses responsible for the totality of humanity. And this statement is a philosophical statement. And every, each time a, a nation uh, uh, affirms itself as such, they don't say, the, na the, the people don't say, we are such and such, we, are, we have blue eyes and blonde hair and so on. No, they say, we are the... Uh, the best representative of, of mankind. And then for, uh, a philosophical discourse follows before that. So uh, we try to demonstrate, I can't of course do this here now, to demonstrate that all the nationalistic discourses were uh, philosophically structured, were philosophy, so to speak. And we try to understand why it, it was so and uh, uh, why it was urgent to 
deconstruct this logic of uh, exemplariness, exemplarity, uh, uh, the, the statement, we are responsible for we Germans, we English people, we French, uh, we, are, we French people are uh, the, the best uh, witnesses for uh, human rights or we uh, Jews are the elected people, etc. Et and we uh, Germans and so on. And we Europeans are now in charge of uh, human rights. 